Ireland. These Ulster Scots, or Scots-Irish, defeated all attempts by the oppressed native Irish to throw them out. By the end of the century, they, too, were a persecuted people, Presbyterians at the mercy of the British landlord class who ruled Ireland. Presbyterian Church, a 16-year-old girl stands trial. These 18th century Scots-Irish were a quiet, inward-looking people obsessed with their own strict religious code. Yet before the century ended, they would challenge Britain for political power in Ireland. Before my Lord Jesus and this godly congregation. Before my Lord Jesus, godly congregation, I confess. Come on, woman. That I did commit fornication. Louder. Fornication. With? Adam. As the clerk, on the 10th day of November, in my father's report, as the Lord has been in front of me. Margaret Harvinson has confessed to the awful sin of fornication and has stood for three Sabbaths Good work, Elder Ray. A fine example. On the stool of repentance, and is now duly of gold. The winter of 1771 was the harshest in Ulster for half a century. Bitter frost and heavy snow followed a wet summer, and many tenant farmers faced starvation. Landlords turned whole families out on the roadside because they could not pay their rents. Among Presbyterians, the muted drums of revolution were already sounding. Evictions brought violent reaction in the countryside. The hearts of steel... A shadowy organization of tenant farmers and weavers waged war on landlords, maiming cattle and burning homes. from Presbyterians to keep up the official Protestant church added to their bitterness. Betwixt landlord and rector, the very marrow is screwed out of our bones. We care not whether we live or die. Death. 
For several years, the Steel Boys virtually ruled the countryside. The authorities hit back savagely. Steel Boys were hanged on the flimsiest evidence. Despite this, secret societies had taken root in Ulster, and the harvest would be reaped in 1798 in a summer of bloodshed. Cottage weavers like Sam Wilson were the backbone of the radical movement. Well-educated and independent, they provided a link between the violent men of the countryside and the liberal intelligentsia. Sam Wilson and his fellow weavers looked to revolutionary America for political inspiration and often for a safe refuge. Sarah! On Sunday last, sailed from Larne for Charleston in the Lord Dunluce, the Reverend William Martin and near 400 other passengers, all in high spirits. All in high spirits? I'd be a fear, Tom. A fear, what? For the sea, Sam. Martin has four other ships, trusted and ready to sail. That's for us, sir. America. America? Sure, Caroline is fully our folk. But should we be among friends there? There's the Irwins and the Gordons. Sam, Martin's folk are Covenanters. Covenanters? And what's wrong with Covenanters? Better than the church folk kissing the landlord's arse. I'll tell you something, sir. The Covenanters are with us. Sam, Sam, you'll end on the gallows. Money. That's the sticker. Sarah! Andy! To work. Tomorrow at the market. The death of a poor peasant farmer, Johnny Johnston, provoked an extraordinary incident. An incident which showed the depth of feeling between Presbyterian and Anglican in Ulster during the American War. Poor Johnny. It was sudden, Sam. Gay sudden. business, Sam. Uh, bad, Isaac. I've sold but a yard of brown cloth since June. The American War. It's killed the trade. American rebels. Rebels not. Sure, most of them's our own folks fighting against British tyranny and British taxation. It's all in the Belfast newsletter. The Belfast newsletter? Sedition and lies. Uh, well, if you don't believe the newspapers, listen to the minister. Mr. Dixon called this attack on the Americans a mad crusade. I can quote you his words. Sure, there's scarce a Protestant family in the lower or middle classes but has brothers and cousins in America. That's us, not The Presbyterians. The real Protestants. Not the bishops and their parish neckies. Every decent man in Ireland is cheering the Americans. Hush, Sam. This is my good man's wit. Not a market day. Sorry, Ma. Ulster buzzed with news of the fighting on the other side of the Atlantic. Liberal clubs toasted the martyrs of Lexington and sent messages of congratulation to General Washington. While Irish Catholics generally backed the British, Presbyterian Ulster took the revolutionary cause to heart. Poor Johnny. He'll not see the day of freedom. 
Judge me, O Lord. For I have walked in my integrity. Stand aside, gentlemen. Let us bury our brother in seemly fashion. I am Mr. Pierce, and this is Mr. Hull. We are the church wardens. Gentlemen. It is our duty to ascertain the character of the corpse and to judge if he is worthy to be laid in this hallowed ground. As his minister, I assure you he was worthy. Minister? I can name minister in this parish for our own rector. You, sir, are no but a dissenting preacher. Get out of the way, Sam. Lay down the coffin. Let us hear what these gentlemen have to say. This is a trial. They are going to try a dead man. Patience, son. Proceed, gentlemen. Was the corpse a dissenter? He belonged to God's own Kirk. He was no idolater or papist. Mr. Johnson chose what you gentlemen would describe as the unofficial road to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> was he a steel boy or any other form of moonlight rascal? No, sir, no, sir. Our dead brother took no part in the protest against oppression. <laughs> I'll warn you, preacher. I'll hear no sedition. Was the deceased an industrious Christian of good moral character? Oh, but what the big, big man? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, let me tell you about our friend. Johnny, like the rest of us, was no saint. He was drunk most market days at Cumber. But never at Newtown. He didn't like the new town ale. <laughs> <laughs> Was he an industrious Christian? Well, Johnny seldom came to church and usually slept when he did. Was he industrious? Well, it wasn't hard work that killed him. <laughs> but gentlemen, Johnny was a good husband and father and kindly neighbor. And I tell you, gentlemen, I'd swap my chance of heaven for Johnny's any day. I Ken Johnson well. For a black mouth, he wasn't a bad buddy. The funeral can go on. Not yet. I want to warn you Presbyterians. In future, we'll need a certificate of character with every corpse. My shepherd, I'm not one. He makes me down to life. Deep resentment against the official Protestant church had been simmering among Presbyterians for nearly a century. Within the decade, they would make an armed bid to set up an Irish Republic. Middle-class liberals like the Reverend Steele Dixon would give the lead when these country radicals went into battle. And he too walked us made. In 18th century Dublin, a concept emerged which today seems incredible. That of a Protestant Irish nation where Catholics would continue to be a servant class without the right to vote or sit in Parliament. As it was, a totally Protestant Irish Parliament sat in Dublin's College Green. It was dominated by aristocratic landowners and bishops, unrepresentative of the great majority of Irish people, whether Catholic or Ulster Presbyterian. Yet even then, in the elegant surroundings of College Green, there were stirrings of a new liberalism. The Irish volunteers, led by the Protestant upper and middle classes, were raised ostensibly to protect the country from French invasion. They quickly became political, demanding that the Dublin Parliament should be free to make laws for Ireland without British interference. The Ulster Presbyterians volunteered enthusiastically and ministers like James Porter of Grey Abbey exchanged their clerical coats for the scarlet or blue of the volunteers. 
Now the Scots, Irish, and Ulster, like their American cousins, had the right to bear arms, and a citizen army like that which had won American liberty. Radicals like James Porter were prepared to fight, but their aims were far-reaching. They wanted a reformed, democratic parliament in which Catholics could sit. Aims like these frightened not only the aristocratic leaders of the volunteers, but many ordinary Protestants as well. The Belfast of the Volunteers was a Presbyterian town, enlightened and radical in politics. In it, the Scots-Irish found a cultural identification with the country they had occupied for two centuries. A festival of native Irish harp music was held, and the Irish language was taught in Presbyterian schools. The French Revolution was the catalyst that changed political theory to military action. I, James Porter, Minister of the Gospel, in the presence of God, do pledge myself to my country. That I will use the best of... The original United Irishman was an open movement for constitutional reform. But among the members were some Presbyterians who wanted an independent Irish Republic along French revolutionary lines. ...in accomplishing this chief good of Ireland, I shall do whatever lies in my power to forward a brotherhood of affections, an identity of interests, a communion of rights, and a union of power among Irishmen of all religious persuasions, without which... When Britain went to war with revolutionary France, the association went underground. Historian Tony Stewart. The Presbyterians of Antrim and Down were really the first Irish Republicans. By 1790, they had, of course, received a great boost from the American and French revolutions. These men were also patriots. They loved their country. But the patriot produced by the French Revolution was unlike the more inward-looking nationalist of later times. In this respect, the Patriot was a cosmopolitan who wanted all mankind to be freed from the restraints of an outworn social system. The Reverend James Porter was an ardent advocate of such ideas. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a little sketch of my own composition entitled Billy Bluff and Squire Firebrand. Oh, one other thing. My characters are totally fictitious, and any resemblance to real and important people is purely coincidental. Mr. Porter, sir. Porter? What about Porter? Still at the same old game, sir. Reeling again the war, again paid, and, sir, against the game law. Against the game law, sir, damn villain. And he's still reading up the newspapers. Reading the newspapers? Blog, sir. He should be blogged. Stop. Shut up, damn you. What else? Him and the Popish priest. Porter and the Popish priest? Aye, drank together. Shaked hands on it, they did. Drank toasts and sang songs. Toast? What toast? The priest drank prosperity to old Ireland. A infamous toast! The word old should never be applied to any country but England. And then Porter drank. Every man his own road to heaven. His own road to heaven. So a man could go to heaven without belonging to the Church of Ireland. Oh, oh. <laughs> Rubbish. Am I right, Billy? Oh, right on the hill square, Your Honor. Sir. Did they drink? No more kings, Billy. They did, Your Honor. And shaked hands on. They shall both be hanged! Flop! 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 You've done well, Billy, my boy. <laughs> Bring me more news, and maybe I'll get you a job. 
breaking stones. Oh, God prosper, Your Honor. You're the heart of corn. Porter's sketch described the fear with which the authorities regarded an alliance between Presbyterian and Catholic. Lord Londonderry satirized in the sketch, neither forgave nor forgot. The United Irish Organization spread through Eastern Ireland, but it was riddled with government informers, and in a preemptive strike, the authorities arrested most of the leaders. A rising in County Wexford rapidly turned sectarian, and Catholic rebels slaughtered their Protestant neighbours. At Scullabogue, 200 Protestants were locked in a barn and burned alive. Ulster, too, prepared for revolution. Pikes were secretly forged in the smithies of Antrim and Down. Fifteen-year-old Willie Nelson joined enthusiastically in the great adventure. The night before the battle was spent in premature victory celebrations. The morning found many of the rebels still drunk. of Antrim and Down, United Irishmen turned out to fight. The Presbyterians wore their best clothes as if they were going to church. The Catholics, in general, failed to support the rising. <laughs> the women folk baked a supply of oat cake to last three days. A time estimated to beat the British. Forward! March! The long march to the battlefield through the summer heat took its toll. rebels deserted their platoons in the way to join the main army. The 
rebel commander, Henry Joy McCracken, devised a strategy which came close to success. In Antrim and Down, every unit of United Irishmen, about 500 or so men, under the command of a colonel, was to seize the military post nearest to them and isolate it from the army headquarters in Belfast and Lisbon. Then, the towns of Ballymena, Antrim, Randallstown, uh, St. Field, Balnehinch, Portaferry, and Newtonards were to be seized. The rebels captured Randallstown and Ballymena, but the key attack on Antrim was a disaster. The untrained rebels were slaughtered, and in a single day, the United Irish cause in County Antrim was lost. In County Down, the rebels' timing went wrong. Their rising did not begin until the Antrim revolt was crushed. Then, after a minor victory at Saintfield, they attacked Ballina Hinch. Dear Father, I'm afraid you'll be troubled about me, but with God's help, there's no danger. Our army is about 5,000, commanded by General Munro. <laughs> a part of our army went to Ballina Hinch today, and the soldiers ran before ours got near to them. I intend to be home as soon as possible. Such high hopes and such innocence were not the stuff to win battles. The rebels gathered at Windmill Hill overlooking the town and at Edna Valley Hill to the southwest. The main battle was fought in the streets of Alma Hinch, where the rebels, cut to pieces by the massed firepower of the British military, resisted stubbornly to the end. God damn these stiff-necked prisoners! They won't run away! A stand was made in the woods of Montalto House near the town. There, the last of the rebels were cut down by the British cavalry. Willie Nelson was hanged on a tree near his own home. The Reverend James Porter before his own church. The executions continued for weeks, but many rebels escaped to the freedom of America. The Ulster Scots turned away from Irish nationalism, but it was not just military defeat which changed their minds. The sectarian massacres in Wexford had left them with a deep distrust of their Catholic fellow rebels. Gravestones are the only Ulster monuments to the men of 98. The rebellion was ill-conceived, badly organized, and ultimately pointless. But it sprang from generous hearts, and the rebels died with hardly a blemish on their name. The Presbyterian community, New Light, Old Light, Seceder and Covenanter, gave some of their brightest and best in a cause that was only partly their own. 18th century was a town of 20,000 people, open to the countryside, and by the standards of the time, humane and tolerant. Ninety years later, it had become a crowded city, sectarian, claustrophobic, and run by a ruthless, uncaring capitalism. Part of the reason for the change lay in the geography of Belfast. Bounded by high hills to the west and lower ones to the north and east, it was a natural cockpit. In the narrow streets, fears and frustrations lacked the space to dissipate. 
It was an atmosphere which bred violence and enterprise, bigotry and business acumen. The Industrial Revolution altered the character of the city. Entrepreneurs like Thomas Mulholland changed linen making from a cottage trade to a large scale industry. By the mid century, Mulholland's mill was the biggest of its kind in the world. The Belfast newsletter had moved from its radical position in the 18th century. Its editor was now the mouthpiece of the new Scots Irish capitalism. Our great emporium of trade, manufacturing and commerce excites the admiration of every community. We have warehouses of large dimension and great beauty. Factories that cease not from morn till night. The industrial boom, from the workers' point of view, was less picturesque. Workers in the Belfast linen mills had the longest hours and worst conditions in Britain. C.D. Burden, medical officer for the Belfast Factory District. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what you have just seen is house or flax dust. It affects the workers as follows. The first symptom is dryness here in the windpipe. The infection spreads to the lungs and causes attacks of coughing. In severe cases, the attack does not pass off until the contents of the stomach have been ejected. When aged about 30, the worker's appearance begins to change. The face gets an anxious look, and the shoulders get rounded. The greatest number die before 45 years. Belfast was expanding faster than any other city in the British Isles. West Belfast grew up around the linen mills. The Falls, the Shankill and the Crumlin districts spread out like fingers from the town centre. All three were Protestant. During the Great Famine of the 1840s, thousands of people moved from the Catholic counties of West Ulster into Belfast. The Catholic population of the city rose dramatically and with it sectarian tension. Rioting became endemic. Sectarian violence seemed to offer relief from the monotony of lives controlled by the factory hooter. Marches, meetings, even sermons supplied the opportunity. Boston and Pittsburgh are, in many respects, quite similar places in the 19th century. Both of them grow from quite small towns in the, at the early part of the century to very large metropolises, several hundred thousand population uh, in the later part of the century. Both of them driven by rapid industrialization, and uh, both of them having, to begin with, uh, a basically Ulster Scotch, Scotch-Irish population, and 
certainly as late as the 1840s and 50s, we'd see some, some really strong social similarities, too. For example, uh, around 1850, there was a street preacher in Pittsburgh named Barker, who at one point got himself elected mayor, who reminds us in many ways of some of the street preachers in Belfast whose activities led directly to the kinds of sectarian rioting that we so prominently associate with 19th century Belfast. Brethren, your blood-bought rights have been imperiled by the Romish mob. Your ministers have a legal right to preach in the open air. You have a right to listen to them. But when you assemble, leave part of the thoroughfare clear so that those who do not choose to listen may pass by. Call that clearance the Pope's Pond. Belfast looked out to the wide world. Throughout the 19th century, its port and its shipyard grew side by side. By the 1880s, Belfast Harbour was a bustling place for the worldwide trade in linen, ships and food. By 1900, Harland & Wolfe was the biggest shipbuilding firm in the world a position which it held well into the 20th century. Belfast shipbuilding had begun to boom in the 1860s, and for the next hundred years it was the major economic factor in the prosperity of the city. In 1870, Harlands launched the Oceanic, and her record-breaking runs brought them into the lucrative transatlantic trade. In the 80s, they were the first with steel hulls and turnscrew liners. In 1889 came the launch of the world's first luxury liner. Now the workers shared a little of the prosperity. Wages were three times as high as in the linen mill. But despite this, the Scots-Irish people had become, for the first time, two nations the haves and the have-nots. In 1888, Belfast was granted its charter as a city, and with this new status, the canny burghers lost some of their reticence about outward display. Pomp and circumstance was the new theme in civic affairs. The austere white linen hall was replaced in the early 1900s with a grandiose building in stone and marble. The theme reached full orchestration in the rich ornamentation and lavish statuary of this, Belfast's new city hall. Empire and trade, Victorian values and sound business principles. A booming city, cap-touching workers, a red brick mansion on the Malone Ridge, a quiet Sabbath to talk to the great businessman in the sky. For a few, the long-sought Eden had arrived. In 1912, Harlands built the world's biggest and most publicized liner, the Titanic. The shipbuilder magazine called her virtually unsinkable. The 
Titanic sank with heavy loss of life. Scots Irish pride had had its come up in. William McKinney was a well-to-do Scots-Irish farmer living at Mollusk in the northern outskirts of Belfast. He was born in 1832 and died in 1917. His lifetime coincided with the transition of the Scots-Irish from radical nationalists to conservative unionists. William's granduncle had died fighting for the rebels in 1798, but in 1912, William himself signed the Ulster Covenant against Irish home rule. Sentry Hill, a Victorian house reconstructed from an earlier Georgian one, was the home of the McKinney family. well-kept grounds and air of prosperity show how the Scots-Irish had risen socially, as well as changing politically in the 19th century. Social historian Bran Walker. McKinney's arrived in Antrim in the early 18th century, and their experience is typical of many of this Scottish Ulster community. In 1798, these people were rebels. Because of various social, religious and political disabilities, they were aggrieved against the system. And so they fought at the Battle of Antrim as United Irishmen. Eighty-six years later, however, when this house is reconstructed, things have changed dramatically. The house itself is a reflection of this. This is a strong, late Victorian farmhouse. These people have firmly put down their roots. They are firmly at home here. In the course of the 19th century, those disabilities which caused them to rebel in 1798 have largely gone. In the closing years of the 19th century, a sense of harmony developed in the Ulster countryside. Life moved to the rhythms of the farming seasons, the spring ploughing and sowing, the autumn harvests. The new confidence of the Scots-Irish tenant farmers sprang from secure farm leases and steadily rising agricultural prices. Horses and livestock were looked after as never before. The Ulster countrymen became proud of their possessions. Other Scots-Irish people, like the McKinneys, found an identity with Ulster but it was not in the romantic nationalism of the Catholic Irish. The Scots-Irish identity was with the land, with the fields which over the centuries had finally become their own. By 1885, Ireland is divided into a community uh, of, on the one hand, nationalists, and on the other hand, unionists. Now the McKinneys, and most of their Presbyterian brethren, are very firmly a part of that union's community. From the 1890s, unionist opposition to Irish Home Rule was well organized. When the Home Rule Bill was passed by the British Parliament, Protestant Ulster protested in a single unified voice. In September 1912, Thousands gathered at Belfast City Hall to sign a covenant, pledging themselves to resist the setting up of a Dublin Parliament. Shiploads of weapons were smuggled in to arm the newly formed Ulster Volunteer Force.
Although life in the farms and factories went on as usual, the Ulster Scots, calmly and efficiently, prepared to put their covenant pledge into action. Guns were distributed all over Ulster and hidden in homes, barns, and even under the floorboards of churches, just as the arms for the 98 Rebellion had been hidden. If the British government decided to put home rule into action, there was every chance that the Scots Irish would once again face the British army in battle. The outbreak of the First World War in 1914 ended the prospect of such a clash. The Ulster Volunteer Force joined the British Army. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the 36th Ulster Division lost five and a half thousand men and won four VCs. Tom McKinney, grandson of William McKinney, who had grown to manhood with the worsening home rule crisis, was among the British dead. In the same year as the song, extreme Irish nationalists rose in rebellion in Dublin against British rule. The 1916 rebellion was crushed and its leaders executed, but the event deepened the divisions in Ireland. Years of guerrilla warfare between Irish rebels and British soldiers ended in a peace treaty in 1921 and a British withdrawal from Southern Ireland. The island was divided in two. The Irish Free State with 26 counties, Northern Ireland with six. Ironically, in the creation of Northern Ireland, the Scots-Irish got something which they had not asked for, their own state. But the solution of an old problem was only the beginning of a new one. (laughs) 